Next, chilling effect. I think this must be one of the most overused phases. Free speech should not be affected by this bill. We are talking here about falsehoods, we are talking about bots, we are talking about trolls, we are talking about fake accounts, and so on. Prof. Theo Lien gave evidence during the select committee hearings on the ambit of free speech and whether falsehoods were free speech. She made the following points. Not all forms of speech are worthy of equal protection. For example, if you falsely cry fire in a crowded theater, that's not protected as valuable speech. UK House of Lords judgment, there is no human right to disseminate information that is not true. <clears throat> no public interest is served by communicating misinformation. The working of a democratic society depends on the members of that society being informed and not misinformed. Misleading people, purveying as facts, purveying facts as statements which are not true is dist purveying as facts statements which are not true is destructive of the democratic society. Where speech does not serve the justifications for free speech by harming the search for truth or by preventing citizens from becoming informed on issues, that does not warrant protection. Next, definition of public interest is too wide. It's important to remember that the bill does not cover statements just because they are against public interest. Those statements must be false statements of fact in the first place. Some have said the definition of what is in the public interest is too wide and that it should not include clause 4F, which relates to the diminution of public confidence in the functions of government institutions. I have explained earlier in some detail, maybe too considerable a detail, uh, how online falsehoods seek to break down trust by attacking institutions. It is important to protect institutions from falsehoods. And if you look at the point I made many times, you look at the current definition and you look at the existing definition and decide for yourself which is wider. And then it is said it's difficult to challenge a minister's decision. I have previously said the process that will be in place, it will be fast, it will be simplified to allow individuals to appear and present arguments on whether it is true or false. The detailed procedure will be in subsidiary legislation, and that's usual, but I will set out an overview of the process. First, an aggrieved person must apply to the minister to cancel a direction. This is consistent with the usual position of exhausting administrative remedies before resorting to the courts. We'll provide a standard form online for aggrieved persons to use. Form must be sent to an email address which will be set out in the direction and the relevant minister must make a decision no later than two days after the form is received, excluding non-working days. The appeal to court will be similarly quick. The appeal will have to be filed no later than 14 days. This is up to the applicant. He can file the very next day if he wants, after the minister decides on the application to cancel the direction. Simple standard forms will be provided for the appeal documents that an appellant can fill out and file in the courts. The courts will be asked to fix the hearing within six days of an application being filed. The applicant must Appellant must attend before the duty registrar to request for an expedited hearing, again in the manner prescribed by the rules of court. Documents will, be need, documents will need to be served on the minister no later than the next day. Again, an email address will be provided for the appellant to serve the documents on the minister to make it easy for him. So minister must then file his or her reply in court no later than three days after the documents are served as prescribed. As stated earlier, meanwhile, the court would have already fixed the hearing no later than six days after the date on which the court first receives the application. So to summarize, a person aggrieved by a direction will have the opportunity to have his or her case heard in the High Court as early as nine days after he initiates a challenge by writing to the minister. So this includes the time the minister responds, the time for filing, the time for him to file, and the time for the minister to respond, and the hearing, beginning to end. 
If he moves very fast, it can be nine days. They will have to be working days. The court will continue, of course, to have a general discretion to extend timelines where there is good reason to do so. How long the hearing takes and how long the court takes to decide are matters for the courts, parliament and the executive cannot intervene in that. We can say when it should be heard. We cannot say when it should be decided. Court fees will be kept very low for individuals. No hearing fees will be charged for the first three days. Further days of hearing will be charged at usual rate, but even then the court will have power to waive fees. But this should not be taken as a license to abuse the process. Courts will still have the power to deal with parties in the usual manner, including how they conduct themselves. 